This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 246, recorded on August 16th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How are you doing, Alan? Doing okay. Um, things are uh, there. There's a bathroom renovation going on in the back in the background. So if you hear some uh, some sanding or cussing or what have you, that's probably not me. So I I saw you about two weeks ago at in Boston, right? Yes. Yeah, that was a blast. It seems like forever. I don't know. Yeah. Why. Yeah. But it, that was a good show. We got some good comments on that. Yeah. Um, really enjoyed it. And so I I um, let's see. I took the train out. And mm -hmm. Mass Pike was a mess. You must have gotten yes. hammered. Oh yeah, I was. <clears throat> it was it was a fun <laughs> ride back. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy there, Vincent. Hi, Alan. How hey, are Rich. you guys? People may. Um, well, I'll I'll wait to explain what we're doing here until we're done. Uh, also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. You've been on vacation a bit, right? Yeah, I went to Glacier National Park for a week. Ooh. Nice. It was, was it very nice, yeah. That was right after ASV, is that correct? Uh, no, it was the first week of August, so there was some time in between. You know, ASV seems like last year already. It, it's just <laughs> crazy how the time insulates what you do from what you're mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. Right here, I am actually not in the TWIV studio. I'm on uh, I'm on leave this week, and um, I'm at our our vacation home repairing storm damage um, for most of the week. And here the weather is absolutely gorgeous. It's sunny, no clouds in the sky whatsoever. 24 degrees Celsius, 45 percent humidity. All that heat that we had before is all gone. What do you got for wind? <laughs> no wind. No wind. Two, two I mean, you were talking. Per hour. You were talking about sailing, so I thought that was relevant. Well, two kilometers per hour here on land. Uh, it could be different out in the water, as you very, as you know. Um, but it's yeah, it, it's, it still doesn't sound like a good day for sailing. No. Hmm. Well, we'll make it out there and just stall. Yeah. Any other weather to hear about? That's, well, uh, I. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh Alex. yeah, it's pretty much the same weather here. We've got 72 Fahrenheit. Uh, Clear blue skies, a couple of puffy clouds, absolutely gorgeous. How about you, Kathy? 71, <clears throat> excuse me, 71, no clouds, dew point 54, humidity 55. Wow, it's getting detailed. What happened to looking out the window? Uh, I did look out the window, to no clouds. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, since I'm not in... Wait a minute. I'm sorry, I forgot you, Rich. <laughs> I thought believe, it would be the same. But no, believe it or not, well, it actually is pretty close. Believe it or not, in north central Florida in mid August here, it is a mere 76 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, mm -hmm. dew point 71, so that's 86% humidity, and it is mostly cloudy, and I got rained on while I was uh, riding my bike in today. Wow. So there you go. Now, um, since since I'm not in studio, we're we're recording this in a different way. We're using a Google Hangout on air, and um, I have not. Uh, so what what this does is record the audio and video. So all four of us have video here, and we'll release a video of this episode. But if if I had advertised this, we would actually have listeners. And I notice we already have one viewer who just stumbled upon us. Um, now we have two viewers. Interesting. <laughs> hey, uh, we could we could tweet this. You can. I cannot do it at the same time. But if you want to tweet it, okay. Uh, I don't. I don't know how. You, what link you give them? Uh, you don't give them the hangout link itself, um, but uh, something else. And um, I don't know how to do that actually. So I'll leave it up to you to discover. <laughs> anyway. Um, now you can see what's in people's background. So mine is not relevant because I won't be here again in the future. But 
Uh, let's look at Alan Dove there. He's got bugs on this shelf. I yes. notice he's got some <laughs> sort of some sort of certificate or a couple of them up there. Some yeah, I went ahead and I, I finally got around to hanging up my degrees. I, I needed stuff on the wall, so. <clears throat> you got your PhD degree up there? Yeah, yeah. That's um, let's see. One of those is uh, well, there's an undergraduate degree, and then there's Master of Arts, Master of Philosophy, Doctor of Philosophy. So. Yeah, I like the bugs on the mantle there. I like the bugs too. Yeah, we've uh, we built up a little collection of those. Yeah, Most of those was, are my wife's, actually. It was your grandfather who was the entomologist. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Uh, uh, Walter Dove was the entomologist, um, and uh, if you're reading the Walter and Ina blog, you're you're reading right now about uh, uh, some of his wartime correspondence. He's working on uh, this this new, really cool insecticide to uh, to fight lice in the troops. Uh, right. Prevent typhus, um, something they've they've referred to variously as uh, I think neocid and uh, gesserol, and eventually they'll just start using the chemical abbreviation, which is DDT. Uh huh. So I'm looking at the Google Plus page, and it shows on my and that we are recording. So if you want to tweet that, Alan, that would be. Yeah, fun. I, I'm going to send the link. To the, the link to the hangout won't work, you don't think? Well, no, then they'll want to join, and we don't want to do that. We don't want to um, do that. <laughs> there, there is some other... Uh, I don't know how you send a link to the hangout. Um, you have a Google Plus page, right? Well, suddenly, yeah, because I had to for this thing. So I think if you go there, um, you will see that you're in a, a hangout on air, and you could share it, okay? Okay. Kathy Spindler is now up, and I see a bike behind you. Right, and I have a big. Like, you get to work now and then, right? Right, when it's not raining or snowing. How many miles do you go? Uh, this is my shortest bike commute ever. It's just a little over a mile. So. And, and the paper on the wall looks like old printouts. It's a it's a huge Excel spreadsheet of everybody who's ever been in my lab, and when they were there. Wow. Yeah. And, and you keep it up to date. Yep. Yep. So the newer stuff is. Kind of over. I can't still can't figure out which way to move. But yeah, yeah, it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> it's the newer stuff. I had to do a whole new list of people because it was so far away from that other list. So neat. Yeah. And I, if I remember when I visited, you had some metal sculpture hanging somewhere. Yeah, I have. I have lots of uh, little virus-like things. Uh, one of them is kind of like a coronavirus that started it, and then. Uh, just other virus-like things, and then pictures in the corner of the wall, which cool. I guess you can kind of see there. Yep. Yeah. See it. So let's take a look at Rich Condit's office here. You got lots of pictures on. It. What, what is that horizontal one right behind? Uh, that's that? that's new. That uh, that is a. Um, geez, I'm going to have to go look and get the artist. It is a print uh, that I discovered uh, via a. Um, uh, an, an emerging infectious disease cover. It's by uh, Alexis Rockman, and it's called Manifest Destiny, and it's a mural that I think is somewhere in New York, and it's a surrealistic uh, mural of you know, like this Brooklyn 5,000 years from now. Wow! So uh, a, a close-up of it, and I, actually, I could put I could put the EID cover probably in the show notes. Uh, I'll remind me, and I'll find that. Uh, it's got the uh, this is post global warming, right? So the Brooklyn Bridge is underwater; just the towers are sticking up. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's got a few viruses floating around and some weird creatures and that kind of stuff. I just thought it was very cool. So, and of course, there are kids there. A bunch which, of kids, old pictures. I... Ibby was looking at this the other day because I was uh, my wife, because I was uh, making sure I could do this uh, hangout thing using her as a uh, test, and she said, man, those pictures are really old. You've got to update those. Of course, the one poster-shaped one there is deliberately old. That's the kids when they were really young, just over my right ear. Yep. Mm -hmm. and then, right above, right above <clears throat> the very important coffee pot. The very important coffee pot that makes the coffee that I put in my <laughs> Twiv mug. <laughs> That's great. All right, and then, of course, me, I'm just in a home here, and uh, I've thrown everybody out. I sent them off to get something to eat, uh, but there will be noises right After now. After they brought the dog in to lick your ear. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. I really enjoyed that. All right, let's do some twiving. Today we have a few interesting stories to talk about. We haven't had a normal twiv in a while, 
And I must say, we've got so much email. Next time, we're going to have to do a, uh, an all email episode. I wanted to do one this time, but there were so many cool stories uh, I wanted to talk about. Uh, but we do have a follow up from Kathy Spindler, <laughs> actually, to, to TWIV245. And Kathy writes I think the plant virologists may write you about this with more information. But when you discussed what is different about plant viruses that isn't already included in principles of virology, the fact that they don't use surface receptors to infect cells immediately came to mind. How plant viruses enter the plant and plant cells and how they disseminate via movement proteins have some different features from other viruses. Let me just address that before I go on. Uh, so we had, as you know from the TWIV, we had a textbook meeting last week and, and I heard, as you did, a great talk at ASV on a, by a plant virologist who emphasized this, that it, the way that plant viruses move from cell to cell and how they enter cells is quite different from other viruses. And at the meeting, I, I did mention that we should somehow mention this in, in one of the chapters of the textbook. The, the thing is, you could write a lot of information about plant and insect and bacterial viruses that would contribute principles, but then the book would start to get very big. And, you know, we want to get it out in a timely fashion. So that is our excuse. Well, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be principles of virology, not the encyclopedia of virology, right? Right. But here in this case, as Kathy points out, this is a principle that when you don't have a cell surface receptor, you know, you have to use a vector to get into cell. You have to disseminate via movement proteins. And Good point. I think yeah. those are very interesting, and um, you know, I think in my chapter, I, I do, I shouldn't say my chapter because they're all our chapters, but I, I write the draft of the entry chapter, and I'm going to put in a substantial amount on, on how plant viruses get in, and I told the, the other authors, please try and include things in your chapters that would establish a principle using a different virus. All right, continuing, and if we are not supposed to use expression with respect to proteins, what words are we supposed to use? <laughs> How are we to infer more than just the translation of proteins, but things like they're being expressed in various locations, e.g. on the cell surface? I'm at a loss for words here. Wait, when did we decide we weren't supposed to use expression? Well, uh, <laughs> that's in the textbook it's discussion. It's in ah. the last week's TWIV. Okay, uh, haven't caught up on that yet. Which was a... Uh, I did a TWIV at my textbook meeting last week in Princeton right. with, with all the authors and um, Jane Flint, who is the, the grammar police, the police woman, I guess, uh, has always objected to certain things and um, one of them is proteins being expressed. She says it's jargon and, uh, you know, genes are transcribed, genes are expressed, but proteins are translated and so forth. I, I must admit that I don't think we're going to change the way people describe it. The point is, in our textbook, we, we decide on a nomenclature and we keep it consistent. So for proteins, we say they are produced, they are synthesized, they are translated, and so okay. forth. But what if you're talking about them being on the cell surface? What, what verb do you use? They're, so usually you would use expressed on the cell surface, right? Right, that's where I am stuck. They appear uh, on the cell surface. Well, that's they they are located, located on the cell surface. They materialize. I have an email into <laughs> Jane. They beam up to the cell surface. <laughs> I have an email into Jane about this, um, and she hasn't answered yet. But I emailed actually all the authors, and I said Kathy Spindler wants to know what to use. And the funny thing is, uh, I have to read Lynn Enquist. He said, uh, I just shut up when that argument arises and remove the offending phrase. <laughs> After all, it's just an expression. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just an expression. Okay. All right, so perhaps we'll have more forthcoming, Kathy, but uh, that's what I um, see for now. So I, have, I just got a text message from Ray Ortega, who was listening to us live. He said, it looks and sounds great. Thank you, Ray. Cool. Ray's, Ray, Hi, Ray. Ray. Hey, Ray. You guys remember hey. Ray? He helped us make the needle. Yeah, yeah. Without Ray, we would we would look and sound terrible in the needle video. <laughs> All right. On to science. Well, the first that follow-up was science, but I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Pandora virus. 
is actually a paper that was published uh, quite a while, a few weeks ago, in the time frame that we're talking about. It seems like forever. It was published in Science on July 19th. Pandora viruses, amoeba viruses with genomes up to 2.5 megabyte megabases, <laughs> megabytes, <laughs> reaching that of parasitic eukaryotes. And the authors are Philippe Legendre, Doutre, Coutet, Poirot, Lescaut, Arslan, Seltzer, Berto, Bruley, Garin, Claverie, and Abergel. And this is the this is the big virus hunting group um, that we've heard from before, right? In Marseille, right. yes. There are actually two big virus hunting groups in Marseille. This mm -hmm. is one. This is one of them. That's right. I heard that. So uh, Clavery is one, and the other is um, I'm blanking on the name. So you got to help me there. Uh, yeah, uh, Ruol, Dieter. Uh, uh, right. I will look it up. Ruol. This is you know, yeah. Ruol. Yes, that's right. So they pro they must have bets going between them of who can yeah. find the bigger virus. Something like that. Anyway, everyone remembers uh, Mimi viruses and Mega viruses. We we have talked about them here on TWIV, and they were huge when they were discovered. Seven hundred and fifty nanometer virions for uh, Mimi virus. One point two million base pair DNA genomes for Mega virus. I just lost. Oh, there you go. But this one is even bigger. These two, they're two viruses discovered in different parts of the world, and they are they're even bigger. Um, so they're both they are both discovered for from environmental samples. So these groups are out there looking to see what what can be the biggest virus that you can find. And they what they do is they take environmental samples, uh, filter it appropriately to get rid of bacteria. And then they culture them in an amoeba, a ca acanthamoeba castellani. So what I like is the one of the things I like here is the targeting of the uh, um, environmental samples. So they know that these viruses grow in amoeba. So they and you, the samples to date have been isolated from places like water towers and stuff right, like that. Right. So they wanted a real uh, a natural ecological niche and they know that these amoeba like to live in sediments. So one of these comes from uh, 10 meters down in a sediment in a, the uh, uh, mouth of a river in Chile Right. And the other comes from the sediment from a bottom of a freshwater pond in Australia. Both and I love this line. I love this line in the abstract. We report the isolation of two giant viruses, one off the coast of central Chile, the other from a freshwater pond near Melbourne. It's it sounds like a fishing trip. <laughs> you know, like yeah. Hauling these big viruses out of the water. All right. And while we may get into the nomenclature a little bit later because one of the commenters on your blog pointed out how the taxonomists can be kind of rigid, not unlike <laughs> grammarians. Um, but uh, what I like is that uh, they name the one that's from the freshwater uh, dulcis or dulcis and the one from saltwater salinus. Right. And ah. in English we call it freshwater and saltwater but in at least the Romance languages, they talk about salt water and sweet water. Huh. So that's where the, the dulcis comes from. So there's Very good. I had not caught on to that. This week in vocabulary. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so they decided for reasons that will be clear to call them Pandora virus and salinus or dulcis. And yeah, the taxonomists don't like that because you're supposed to name viruses uh, either from where they're found or the kind of disease they cause. Right, or, this should be Chilensis and Melburnensis or something like that. Right, but of course Mimi virus broke the rule of megavirus and so forth, so these uh, these groups aren't playing by the rules. So. Well, have these, um, have the Mimi viruses gone through the official naming process? Has that, has that name been accepted? No, they're not. They're, um, <laughs> they, you know, if you look in the ICTV, the latest, they're not accepted in there, so um, they will okay. never be, so that could never be official. It could change, but I, I doubt, you know, knowing these groups, I doubt they're going to uh, do what the ICTV tells them. <laughs> uh, plus, uh, plus, at this point, you know, everybody kind of knows these viruses by these names. 
So, yeah. so, so, what is a 2.5 megabase virus called? Anything it wants to be. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Very good. Gorilla I, virus. Gorilla I, virus. I, that's it. I and they might, here. they might have to make a new family, and maybe these could be the Giga Viridae. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The mega. I don't so know. The, the the Pandora virus is a genus, correct? Um, uh, that I don't know. Oh, wait, that would be if I guess. Yeah, Pandora, Pandora, would Pandora be virus genus. genus they propose. Yeah. And oh, I'm looking. They have a classification here. They have a tree. Um, yeah. So the tree relates the Pandora viruses to the other families. You know, the Phycodnoviridae, mm -hmm. Adenoviridae, etc. But they don't make a family name name out of Pandora virus. Um, right. So yeah, it's a genus. But and you know, there's this thing called megavirus. I don't know if that's kind of just an unofficial grouping of big viruses. Well, in the lower left, they're calling it megaviridae. See. Megaviridae, yes. So that's where the mimis and the mumus and, uh, all and mega the megas virus. and now the pandoras. And the pandoras are different. That's actually one. Right. Of the, Those are the actually thing. family names, I think. Right. Megaviridae, right. Right. But, but the question is, is Pandora a family or a genus? I well, the way they've got it treated here, it would be it. It's it's as if everything else is grouped as a family, so it would be a family. And I frankly, I think that at this point, that would be. Well, I don't know. They could be floating genera. They could be a family. I'm e either one at this point. Yeah, Without... they they use the term genus, um, so I guess that's kind of where they're angling. Right in the in the two word name, the Pandora salinis and the Pandora dulcis. But yeah. But it also <laughs> gets confusing when you when you have a family name the same as one of the genus names. You can think of that for the um, uh, like the. Uh, what is it? The hepatitis A? No, hepatitis C. There's some virus family where where it gets confusing that way. Oh, well, the bunyas, for example. There's the bunya viridae, and then there's the bunya muera. Bunya right. So it'd be nicer if they went to giga viridae or something else. Yeah. Right, right. So the having the family and the virus name is confusing. Right. So picornaviridae, then we have poliovirus or enterovirus and then polio. They're all different, so there's no confusion. Right. Yeah. But. Right. Yeah, and of course taxonomy in general is one of these topics that you can debate <clears throat> endlessly without resolution and and I think viral taxonomy is uh, is on even thinner ice than that. Yep. Yeah. I personally like these. I think Pandora virus is fine, and we, yeah. we all remember them. Yeah, I think them, it's a good so choice. I don't have a problem. Anyway, the Pandora viruses, the two they isolated, they did the genome sequence, and um, the P. Salinas genome is at least 2.77 megabases long, and they say at least because there's, there are repeated sequences at the ends of the genome that are making it difficult to get an exact number. And P. dulcis is 2.47 megabases. And they spend most of the paper on P. salinas because it, apparently P. dulcis genome is a subset of the larger genome. So 2.77 megabases. This is bigger than, it's twice as big as the, the megaviruses and bigger than some bacteria, both intracellular bacteria as well as free-living bacteria, and also bigger than some free-living archaeal genomes. It's amazing. 2,500, roughly, protein coding sequences in the big guy, 1,500 right. in, the, in the smaller guy. And the cool thing is that 93% of those coding sequences have no recognizable counterparts right. among known proteins. This is just, they call this somewhere an alien virus because it's yes. just, it looks weird. We haven't talked about what it looks yet. And the, the proteins are totally novel. Yeah, and in fact, the authors um, kind of pushed the alien virus concept a bit far. Some of the stories that came out about this suggested, uh, you know, this would be what, what, what life on Mars would look like, which, of course, is just absurd. We've, this is clearly a virus that comes from Earth. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but it just, it has all these genes that, don't look like anything else, and it's just because we haven't found anything like this before. Yeah. So one of the questions becomes after a while, uh, is it, and they address this in the paper, is it really a virus, right? Because there are <laughs> intracellular parasites that are not viral. And right. So, so it sort of, it, it, 
begs the question of how do you define a virus and and one of the things that they do is they look over the genes and they look for uh, genes that would be for energy metabolism or protein synthesis or other things of that we think of as uh, functions required for uh, independence in life and they find none of those and uh, and that's uh, at least part of what they use to classify this as a virus though as I was considering that I was wondering well if 93 percent of the genes have no hits in the database how do we know that some of those aren't some sort of specialized version of uh, you know energy metabolism or something like that we just don't recognize it but right. I well, doubt but this, it. yeah this thing also has a life cycle that um, yes that looks very viral and they have the these electron uh, micrographs um, showing the the capsids or the uh, what do they call them teguments um, being assembled and stitched together whereas um, non-viral life tends to bud off or do some other some other type of procedure like that this thing is being built inside the cell that it in fact it looks very viral it looks like a virus to me yeah yes I mean this virus that it enters the cell it the DNA comes out of a portal at one end of the mm -hmm. particle you know so the DNA has to get out whereas m many of these we well, guess all of these bacterial intracellular parasites the genome remains in the organism yeah and uh, so maybe that's part of the definition of viral mm -hmm. that you know, the genome has to get out. Yeah, I that think it well, uncoats. They they do make a point that it definitely has an eclipse phase, and I think that's that's important. And these, but, it, but these, you know, uh, it's big enough to say that it's alive, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another thing. Um, <laughs> but the, the the intracellular bacteria have ribosomes. They have protein translation apparatus, right? Mm -hmm. They just lack genes that allow them to. Uh, reproduce on their own. So here, these these viruses have some protein coding machinery, but not enough to to translate an mRNA on its own. So that's another part of the viral definition. I think you could get bigger and bigger, as long as you the, the viral genome has to get into the host cell to be translated. It's still a virus. But once you you have your own translational machinery, I think then it's no longer a virus. What I think is interesting here is that all these unknown genes, what, what these groups are proposing is that many of these unknown genes came from a fourth domain of life which is no longer extant and that's why we don't recognize them anymore. And that is kind of provocative, I think. Uh, yeah, that's quite provocative. And, and you know, the, the bioinformatics, the phylogenetic analysis uh, can be used and they present this in a paper to support that notion and I think that's very interesting, yeah. yeah. It, right. it is. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, it's deliberately provocative, but of course, you can't prove that at this point. No, no. Right, so it's in the a supplemental figure, figure six, where they show the, the four domains. So it would be eukaryotes, the archaea, bacteria, and then this fourth domain that would include Pandora, cafeteria, Mimi, Moo Moo, and Mega. So. Right. Um. But the, I mean, the observed fact is that it can, it can infect one of the existing domains of life. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Which, I mean, it can infect amoeba, but that doesn't mean that. Um, that is there a, is there an amoeba genome sequence? Mm -hmm. I believe, I believe there is. Yeah. What, do you, uh, what would you like to know if there? Are... Uh, I well, I just want to, I want to know if any of this. Pandora virus dark matter is, uh, in fact, relates to the amoeba yeah, the, genome. The answer is no. I think there was a there was a statement in this paper which said there is no evidence for horizontal gene transfer between these viruses and amoeba. Okay. Yeah, and genomes uh, genome of Acanthamoeba castellanii has has been published. Okay. Least. Yeah. All right. Um, the other thing that's cool here is they can recognize obviously some of the proteins, and some of them have to do with. DNA replication. Some of them have to do with with transcription, um, but the cool thing is that one of the cool things is that there are also introns in some of the genes, and uh, as we know, but that intro, if to splice out an intron, you need to get in the nucleus, right? So the suggestion is that these viruses at least have to spend some phase of their replicative cycle in the nucleus. It's known that they set up cytoplasmic factories like the um, the pox viruses and the Mimi viruses, but having introns means, as far as we know, that you need to get in the nucleus. Unless or you have <laughs> to pack your own splicing enzymes. That's right. That's right. 
Uh, the relationship with the nucleus during a life cycle in this particular case is uh, kind of weird because the nucleus shortly after infection uh, assumes uh, a really weird shape that uh, I suppose could be a little bit of apoptosis or something going on, but ultimately just dissolves completely. That's right. Uh, so the nucleus uh, disintegrates. Um, they call it deliquesces. Yes. <laughs> the structures appear at the periphery of the deliquescent nucleus, which basically means melting. And specifically right. in chemistry, something dissolves by absorbing water from the air. These particles are also very interesting. They have, uh, they're about a micron long and half a micron uh, wide, the kind of oblong shape, and uh, they have a kind of a triple membrane around them and a, what looks like a pore or an apex at one end through which they think the, the genome gets out when these viruses infect cells and they have some very nice EMs of that pore. So they're big enough to see by light microscopy, and they have a right. they have light micrographs of the of the purified particles, which they purify with just a couple of steps on a sucrose gradient. They're so they're so big that they're not difficult to purify. the The structure, the overall structure, is like nothing I've ever seen before. Yep. Yeah. Here's uh, here's the picture of it on the Science magazine. It's so big it fills up the whole cover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's let's take out. Uh, let's put that up again, Kathy. Let's have okay. a look. Because I'm full. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. Yeah. It's a beautiful. I guess it's a colorized uh, EM, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yes. it appears to have a, uh, a a lipid bilayer that's on the inside of the tegument, and then the tegument, it's not known what the composition of that is, but it's probably, my guess, it would be it's got a bunch of protein in it and stuff. Uh, and then this uh, pore at one end. Right. Yeah. Now, we should just emphasize that it's not clear that amoeba are the the actual host in nature, right? It's just that's what was used to isolate it, which means it has a whole strange that includes amoeba, but it may replicate in other hosts as well. Yeah, the assay they're using to hunt for these viruses is to infect amoebae, so anything they find will be able to. Right. Uh, anything else we want to mention? Uh, yeah, I want to spend, uh, because it is just of interest to me, a little more time on what they call the core genes. Okay. Uh, because this relates to what the ultimate phylogenetic relationship is amongst all these viruses. And they refer to a paper that was published in 2001 from the Kunin lab, where the Kunin lab did a bioinformatic comparison of uh, the large viruses that were known at the time, which include, included the pox viruses, iridoviruses, um, aspaviruses, which are African swine fever, and the phycodna viruses, which are uh, these uh, chlorella viruses, they infect uh, blue, uh, blue green algae. So these are large cytoplasmic uh, DNA viruses and they defined uh, conserved genes among these to try and get a grip on what is common amongst all these. And they categorized them as group one through group four depending on uh, which ones were more conserved. Group one are genes that are in all of these. And it turns out that a lot of these core genes show up in these giant viruses. And so they have a table in the uh, supplemental figures uh, that uh, categorizes which of these core genes are present in this virus. Uh, and this virus clearly encodes an RNA polymerase and several of the subunits of the RNA polymerase are among these core genes. Uh, it encodes uh, a packaging ATPase that's uh, involved for uh, uh, presumably in uh, DNA packaging. Uh, interestingly, it's missing some of the uh, core genes that would be involved in early gene transcription that happens in particles. And apparently, there's no RNA polymerase in the particles for these viruses. So these viruses have skipped that part of the life cycle. And they're probably, that would be consistent with them having a nuclear phase where early in the uh, life cycle, they might use, I'm making this up now, but <laughs> I'm extrapolating. They might use the nuclear RNA polymerase to transcribe some early genes and then make a viral RNA polymerase as, as is typical 
circle. And consistent with that, they encode some late uh, transcription factors, including my personal favorite, uh, the A18, what's called a helicase here, which is in fact a, a late uh, transcription uh, termination factor. So a lot of the conserved stuff are DNA replication and uh, and transcription, and it looks like it has a sort of a, a late gene transcription apparatus, but not an early gene transcription apparatus relative to the those viruses. And then the other conserved family that I think is really interesting is uh, a thiol oxyreductase. All right, this is a um, uh, uh, a, a disulfide bond uh, forming system that the pox viruses and other large DNA viruses uh, encode because uh, the cytoplasmic environment is a very reducing environment. So these viruses apparently, if you want to keep uh, disulfide bonds formed, have to encode their own disulfide bond forming uh, 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 reductases. And so there's a system of those. So at any rate, I thought the, the conservation of those core genes was interesting. That's very cool, yeah. It gives you some insight perhaps into uh, the not only the relationships amongst the viruses, but how this particular virus works. I think this will be a lot of fun for people to study. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, I'm yeah. also curious to see what how much bigger you can get. Right. You might say it opens up a whole box of new possibilities. Would you say it opens a Pandora's yes, box? Yes, I, I would say so. <laughs> right. they, a, go ahead. They also make the point that this, or maybe it was that you made it in your blog, Vincent, that this is why we should still be doing basic science, discovery science. We've, we're learning incredibly new things, so yeah. cool things. Yes, they, and, and I'm glad they didn't go with the alternate name, can of worms virus. <laughs> Here's something that I just found um, because I, I didn't have the supplemental material when I, I was first reading it. But So to isolate the virus, they first take their lysed cultures, centrifuge them for five minutes at very low speed to remove the cellular debris. Then they pellet 20 minutes at 3000 G, which is not very hard, and that brings down their viruses. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it would have cells. I think I would still be in the supernatant after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just lots of cool things. Each, They're really each big. new page of the paper had something else that I was just ooing and eyeing about. Really neat. All right, so we have uh, actually some comments on Google Plus already. People are no. watching us from Marin. writes, oh my God, this is so great. Sitting in the lab in Berlin waiting for Medium to warm up and watching you is probably the best thing. <laughs> and w William writes, I love TWIV. It is the best of the best of programs discussing biological phenomena and genetics and viruses. I love you all. Vincenzo et al. Thank you. <laughs> this is what you can do when you do live. <laughs> you get instant gratification. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next story has to do with influenza, avian influenza H7N9 virus and uh, about a week or two ago uh, something like 20 virologists wrote letters to science and nature announcing that they plan to do gain-of-function experiments with the virus and I actually received um, these letters before publication from several journalists asking uh, for my comment and I you know, well, my my bottom line was I felt it was weird that they were announcing that they were going to do this, and I thought, you know, I understand that they're trying to be transparent in the um, in in the um, I, the idea of the H five N one moratorium, which said we have to we have to inform the public about what we're doing, but I just felt that this would lead to horrible headlines about killer viruses that uh, scientists were going to make, and indeed. And USA Today obliged, and others did too. Many others. Scientists plan to make deadly flu viruses. Bird flu researchers want to create deadly virus in lab. So I thought we could just talk about what you guys think about this. Um, you know, I, I think gain of function uh, experiments, well, we've all been doing this for years, right? You give viruses new properties and you study how that happens and the consequences. Do you think that you really should be announcing these sorts of experiments or should you do the tried and true uh, mechanism you write a grant you get funding you do your work and you publish it 
Well, I think the the H5N1 thing um, changed the whole color of this conversation um, because there, the dust up that came out after the ferret experiments and the attempt to censor the ferret experiments and yada, 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 um, yeah, I think that caused a lot of people in the field to take a step back and say, well, how should we have done this? And, um, you know, I, I mean, Vincent, I take your point that the normal grant review process should take all these things into account. And, um, and what you're saying essentially is that scientists can be trusted, but from the public perspective, um, that's a hard argument to make these days because people don't trust anybody or, you know, maybe they shouldn't. <laughs> so the, the trust us argument doesn't carry a lot of weight. And <clears throat> I think the reasoning here is that it, it is probably easier to get permission than forgiveness. Well, they're not asking for permission. They're just saying this is what we're going to do, right? Right. But the advance notice, I mean, there's an implied um, question in this. Uh, if, you, if you haven't done the experiment yet, you're not saying, here's what we did, deal with it. You're yeah. saying, okay, everybody, we're just letting you know, this is what we're going to do, here's our rationale for doing it, and, and putting the calm, rational discussion of the reasons behind the research out there first so that people can, if they want to come out of the woodwork and start attacking it, they now have to attack the calm, rational, abstract argument instead of a fait accompli. Mm. Vincent, you uh, uh, brought this to my attention uh, er early on, and I, you know, I hadn't actually seen the letter. You just uh, told me that this was happening, and my first reaction was the same as yours. You know, why there is a process, okay? And in fact, there was a, a process that came out of the dust up earlier, where they've sort of reactivated the appropriate review process, and that will happen, and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't see the necessity for bringing it up, but in fact, having now over the last day or so uh, read uh, the communication and some of the stuff about it, uh, I, to me this is a, an attempt to do what we've been saying should be done, which is to uh, engage the public better in what the scientists are doing. And, and, and I, I have to agree with Alan on this. Uh, it's, I think it might be, at least in this particular case, given what's gone on uh, uh, recently, uh, better to bring this out to start with and say, look, here it is, rather than, even if it's done by a legitimate process, say, we did this, all right? And no matter what you do, there's gonna be the headlines. And there were the headlines, but you know it didn't, uh, at least so far, hasn't created quite the the stir. There was a little blast of stuff, and it went away. So uh, I think this is a, a an interesting uh, uh, attempt to engage the public in a more active fashion uh, than before. So I think it's interesting. It's okay. What do you think, Kathy? Well, I came upon it because I was on vacation just from the, the news reports and so then I immediately went to Science and Nature to figure out who were the co-signees on the letter and, and what did the letter say. And I too think that it's a way of trying to communicate with the public a little bit better. And uh, as one of the commenters on your blog said, it, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation because here they're trying to say these are the kinds of experiments that were planning to do and here's the conditions under which we'll do them, we'll apply for grant funding, they will be reviewed, they will be done in high containment and here are the possible benefits. Um, you're still going to have people that are going to be upset by this and the, come up with the headlines about, about making deadly flu viruses but it's a way to try and make this information a little bit more public. We know that you can go to what used to be called CRISP and now is called the Reporter, the NIH website, where you can find out all the projects that um, people have gotten funded and are working on. And you could go there and read the abstract of someone's proposal to do this kind of work. But that's a little bit hard to do, even when you know someone's grant is in Reporter and you try and find it, you can't always succeed. So, so. I think this makes it a little bit more accessible to the public 
um, in terms of, you know, here are the uh, the uh, the specific proposed gain of function function experiments in the um, Nature paper. They have it as a gray box. Uh, so I, I kind of feel like it, it's it's a good attempt. They're going to have people upset by it no matter what they do, but this may satisfy some of the public and and so that at least it was put out in advance. Yeah, I'm, I'm just very concerned about the headlines and that the headlines themselves, which don't discuss the benefits of gain of function research, will get a lot of people thinking, wow, we shouldn't be doing this at all. And I think it's, it would probably be hard for them to understand you know, exactly what's being done. So they're influenced by the, the negative headlines. And I'm not sure that that's a good thing. Now here, here on TWIV, it's our job to try and explain uh, these experiments. So I would say in a, in a short letter, how, how much can you really explain? And, and really, who is the, the target audience of a nature and science letter? It's not really the general public, right? Yes, it is in this case. How so? Um, <clears throat> where else would you publish it to have it published in a way that um, that gets your scientific point across? And bear in mind, a lot of the flack that, that came about from the H5N1 experiments came from scientists um, and the you know the whole NSABB process was run by scientists and mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. a lot of the a lot of the objections and the, and um, really the force of the news stories on that was that it was very easy to call up somebody who was a bona fide expert who would say something inflammatory about these experiments and say that they're dangerous um, <clears throat> so I, I think in this case what it, what you probably should do is turn it around and say, what if they didn't do this? Um, what if um, what if they went ahead through the grant process and just went ahead and did the experiments? You'd still get these headlines, but now you'd get these headlines about something that already happened. And I think I think it makes for a much less inflammatory story if people are reading about it as as something that's proposed as if you know to say oh wow you know I'm being I'm being presented with this in advance gee that's the right way to do it I just don't think that nature and science is the right venue because it's not going to reach very many people at all right oh, it I reached a huge it, number of people I disagree we're just no, talking no, it, about a USA well, Today headline that is, but they did not list the gain of function experiments. They left everything out except the killer virus. Had no, but we live in an online world now, and these um, these letters are open access. So I as soon as anybody, as soon as anybody tries to look any deeper, they're going to get the letters themselves. I doubt it. I doubt they're going to get the letters. Most Actually, are not in the going to visit it. in the uh, uh, the USA Today article. Uh, and this is something we've talked about before, they actually have a direct link to the science article in the article. So if you're reading the USA Today article, at least if you're reading it online, and I, I don't know about the print version, you can click on a statement and get the, uh, where it's highlighted in the text, and get the uh, USA Today article. So, I, I, Alan, I agree with all you guys about the, the need for transparency. I just don't think nature and science is the way to do it. They know how to write letters to nature and science, so that's why they did this. But I think a broader um, informational attempt would be better. You could use social media, you can use websites, you can use all kinds of things to get it to millions and millions of people, not just you know a few thousand who are going to see these articles. I would be really interested to see the hit numbers on these articles. I bet uh, they are not very high. Right, but also bear in mind that everything that's in nature and science goes out to the news media a week in advance under embargo. So this is effectively an embargoed press release, a pair of embargoed press releases going out and saying, here's what's going on. Of course everybody's going to cover it. Of course everybody's going to dive into these stories. And incidentally, the headlines at major newspapers are usually not generated by the reporters, so we probably yes, shouldn't yes. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> we right. shouldn't reflexively blame the byline. Uh, there's some anonymous editor sitting there generating yeah. headlines that are that are there to generate clicks. Um, but um, but this is this is a legitimate way to distribute this information, I think. Because it's going to be it's going to be an unfiltered presentation. Uh, a group of scientists can write a letter to Nature or to Science, 
and lay out everything that they want to do. If they need to get technical, they can get technical and they can put it out there <clears throat> and then make themselves available for interviews if somebody has questions. I, I think it's a legitimate way to approach this because what other, what other forum would you choose? The worst, the worst part about this whole thing is the guys who write the headlines. The, yeah, yeah. the, the, USA, okay. or the USA Today article itself is, is not that bad. The headline is atrocious. So how do you corral those guys? Well, that's, that is unfortunately due to market forces that we can't um, corral. Um, USA Today, like the whole print industry, is struggling, and they need to draw attention. And mm -hmm. so the headline needs to say, look at me. Um, and this headline certainly does. Um, that's, that's the truth there. And, I, and <clears throat> it's just an unfortunate situation. So, Alan, you mentioned contacting the authors. Now, I was contacted by several reporters who said they couldn't reach any of the authors for comments. So they're you know, going out to me, which is fine. But it seems to me if you want to broaden the impact, you talk to reporters or people who want to write about your story, right? Okay, now that is a screw-up. And that I also is, think that yeah. um, you could publish this elsewhere. Why just nature and science? There are plenty of, of websites and blogs and news sites that would publish this. Heck, I would publish it on Virology Blog. You know, we get a few thousand visitors a day. It's not bad. I think, it would have been, I think it would have been very helpful if the at least some of the authors on these papers, you know, Ron Fouché and, and uh, Yoshihira Kaoka certainly should have should have made themselves easily available for interviews, um, or they should have had contact information for somebody who was available um, yeah, <clears throat> if they right. were if they were not. That is that is definitely a mistake. Um, and I, and it would have been yes, it would have been nice if they'd had a little more um, presentation of this in interactive media. I don't know if any of these authors are on Twitter or if they you know if they could kind of uh, be out there to to. Um, be the face of this thing, but maybe they just didn't want to. Well, as you know, Alan, if you, you the, the internet ha is an echo chamber, right? Once you get yes. something in a few places, then it goes all over the place, and you just have to strategically hit them, and you can do it. And I, I don't think that Kawaoka or Fouché, you know, think that way. I think they're traditional scientists. They send letters to journals, and that's how yeah. this works. But I think it could have been a lot bigger, and not let the the, the newspapers handle. Uh, be the only ones handling the headlines. Right. I, I would put that on the PR people um, right. at these universities and, and institutions that are going to be doing this, um, who probably should have stepped in and said, hey, look, you know, let's do this right. Let's, um, right. let's make right. you available for interviews and so on. So I think we should, just to be complete, we should mention the kinds of experiments that they want to do, um, these gain of functions. And again, these are with H7N9, which have caused which has caused something like 135 human infections so far, about 40 deaths, I think. And the idea is that this has some pandemic potential of unknown quantity, so maybe we should do some research to uh, be prepared. So they have five bullet points in the article. Um, they want to know, they want to make viruses with altered virulence, host strains, transmissibility in various animal models, and see the effects on the ability of the virus to be neutralized with antibodies to the virus. So do any of these uh, changes in biological properties change the antigenicity? And that would be important because if you make a vaccine to a, the current strain, you wouldn't want it to be nullified by a strain, for example, that has increased transmissibility in humans. Right. They want to adapt this to other mammals and produce reassortants with other influenza viruses to see if reassortants are compatible and, and pathogenic in animals. They want to look at resistance to antiviral drugs to see what kind of changes would lead to that and how fit the viruses would be. They want to do the aerosol transmission experiments in guinea pigs uh, and ferrets. And then they want to try and make the virus more pathogenic uh, in animals to see whether the changes that... that do that, and it's not clear that you would be able to get such viruses, by the way, uh, have any uh, other effects on the virus. And remember, these are all done in animal models, so they give you basic information. They're not predictive, but they're worth doing because, y you know, you can learn a lot from, from doing these sorts of experiments. Okay. Let me get back to here. All right, our last story has to do with HeLa cells. This is another um, 
<laughs> very interesting story that's broken in the last couple of weeks. So I don't know if we talked about this a while ago when the German group did the HeLa cell genome. Did we, did we talk about oh, that? Oh, yeah. With? Yeah, we, we tore them a new one, as I recall. So they, uh, <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They uh, published the, the genome sequence and then quickly retracted it because um, there was a lot of objection. And then a new sequence came out from a group here in the U.S. Uh, published in Nature, and um, so the head of NIH decided that they had to uh, do something about this because the family was getting offended, the family of Henrietta Lacks, of course. HeLa cells being derived from Henrietta Lacks in the early 50s from a cervical tumor at a time when there was no medical consent rules, really. You could do whatever you wanted with samples. And what the NIH has done is to restrict the access of the sequence. You have to apply to see it and then there's a, going to be a committee that will review your application and the committee will include several members of the LAX family uh, and then you will be able to look at the actual sequence. And you know Collins says this was done to protect uh, the family because this sequence of course is derived from a, a member of their family. So what do we think about this, this deal? Well, it's described repeatedly in these uh, correspondences as a unique situation. Um, I'm, I, I was shocked initially that the German group even published the sequence without, you know, considering this. I mean, that's, that strikes me under the circumstances as nuts. Uh, but Having happened, I think that, you know, the appropriate actions have been taken. Um, and, uh, you know, this we're, we're in an age of uh, HIPAA, uh, and I think it's entirely appropriate that uh, 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 patient information, personal information, be de-identified. And it's too late for that in this case. If you're going to have this sequence out there, you uh, can't. Uh, de-identify it and so something has to be done I think in this case to protect the uh, patient's rights. I've thought about what the family must must be thinking this must be a little I mean it must be a little like you know being naked in public you know uh, and so I'm sympathetic to their position and from all uh, it, it looks like uh, from the interactions that uh, the scientists have had with the family, they've been terrific. Uh, that they understand the value of this, uh, but they want their privacy protected. So I think a, uh, a a reasonable compromise has been reached in this case. And I think it also has the uh, interesting benefit of uh, bringing all of these ethical issues uh, out in, uh, in the open. Um, uh, I like the um, last paragraph of this uh, article by Hudson and Collins that says it is, is fit. Nature, is the one from Nature, right? Yeah, it is fitting given the priceless contributions that Henrietta Lacks has made to science and medicine that her story is catalyzing enduring changes in policy. These should afford future generations of research participants the protections and respect that were not in place during Lax's lifetime. And I think that kind of summarizes it. But I thought he said this was a special case, though. It's not making any broad policy decisions. Well, it's a special case in making a, a decision in this case relative to this sequence because of the fact that the identity is already out there. Yeah. It, uh, it has uh, broader implications because uh, presumably it will prevent this kind of stuff from happening in the future and so when people come up with a sequence that you know might have a certain identity uh, or could have a certain identity associated with it um, they'll uh, have a closer look. What do you think Kathy? Well um, it, I hope you include all these links because uh, they each have some different aspect or, or twist to them. One thing is that they had the possibility of either having the sequence be out there and completely public, everybody could access it, or they could have uh, what ended up being the situation where it's uh, accessible through a process to those who can make good use of it. 
and the third possibility was that it wouldn't be released at all. But in conversations with the family, the um, scientists and policy people were able to describe the fact that there's already a lot of HeLa genome sequence out there, and that wouldn't necessarily protect them the same way. So I think that's an important thing. And the, the fact is that the family, I think, really does have a good appreciation of it. Um, Lax Y is, I think, her granddaughter. I can't find her first name quickly yeah, in this think, other right, her granddaughter, yeah. other article, but she says, um, researchers can make major breakthroughs while still respecting the wishes of patients and their families. Have them involved. That's not only for HeLa sequences, but anybody who participates in research. So I, I think it's the, the best possible outcome for this situation. And you know, looking at the primary research article that came out from the University of Washington group, it's fascinating. And the, the kinds of things that they found do start to explain maybe why this was such an aggressive cancer. And that can lead to other investigators looking for things uh, that may help in terms of cancer treatments and, and just basic knowledge. So I, I think it's the best of uh, all possible worlds in, in this situation. So I, I understand the need to do this and I understand the, the family and so forth. What really bothers me is this can inhibit the serendipity in science. So, you know, I'm sitting here in my lab or in my lab to have an idea about HeLa cell and I want to look at the genome, but I can't. I got to apply and then a couple of weeks later I might get approved and by then I've forgotten why I even wanted to look at the sequence. So uh, it sounds trivial, but as you guys know, this is how science often works. It's by accident. And so if you restrict the, the, the sequence to people who have to apply for it, I think it's going to be uh, a dampening effect. And I think, I don't know if this was explained to the family at all. I don't think they would want to dampen research, but I, I suspect that uh, it's not a good way to go about it. I think people who want the sequence will get it elsewhere on the internet, or they'll sequence the the cells themselves, which won't be so hard to do at some point. So but, that's my main concern. I, but I Vincent, understand everything else. Yeah. But, but that that waiting isn't that much different from the waiting that we have to do for other things. You think of some new animal experiment you want to do, you have to get that animal approved in your protocol. If you think of some experiment and you want to get a particular mm -hmm. reagent, if it's from a company, you might get it in two days, you might get it in two weeks. If it's from another investigator, you might get it in two weeks or two years, depending on how long the MTAs take. So so I think that, yeah, if this if this review process takes a long time, that could really inhibit things. But it but my my sense is that it won't take that long. And I, my hope is, I guess, that it won't take that long. And and in my case, for instance, when they you know mentioned that this was at eight Q twenty four point twenty one, that that rang a bell with me immediately because that in fact is very close to where the Li6 genes are in the human chromosome and the Li6 genes are of interest to my own research. And so then I thought, well, I'm never going to be able to find where this is. But in fact, I was able to go, you know, relative to the Li6 genes, I was able to go to the mouse genome and the human genome and figure it out from that. So, you know, for those kinds of quick and dirty questions, maybe it's not really going to be that inhibitory either. And now I I blogged about this on um, <clears throat> on Turbid Plaque, um, and I I I get Finzen's point that um, you know this is this is potentially restrictive of research, but uh, and, and also I think we should acknowledge right at the front, um, as some people have already pointed out, this whole agreement is a bit of a sham, right? Because if you really want the genome sequence to heal the cells, you've got two very obvious routes for getting it you can go into the database where there are pieces of it all over the place and there's free software to assemble all this and you could put together your own. Um, you don't even need a lab to do that. Or you can order up a sample of HeLa cells or take them from, from your lab and send them off to a sequencing company. And this is getting cheaper and cheaper by the second. So this, this idea that somehow this NIH agreement um, builds a wall around access to the HeLa genome is is kind of illusory. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, I'm glad they did it. 
because we're we're charging into a future where all of our genomes are going to be sequenced. Um, you're going to get your genome sequenced at as part of a routine test in your doctor's office. This is just a few years from now. Um, <clears throat> and you'll want your doctor to have that. That'll be good because that'll provide information that will be useful in treating you in the future. Um, at the same time, your insurance company is going to have the information whether you want them to or not. Um, people who people who might be interested in studying it might be able to access it, and right now we're we're all kind of involved in this big nebulous negotiation: what should be allowed and what shouldn't. And I think what this agreement does is it it inserts the research community and the NIH into this discussion with with a very setting of a fairly high bar, and saying, <clears throat> no, it's not going to be a free for all. Your, your genomic data are not going to be available for just anybody to sequence because you had a biopsy done. Um, and yes, it's restrictive and you're going to have to apply and do this and that, but it is much easier to back off of restrictions in the future than it would be to try and put them in place after the fact. Yeah, and I've uh, one of my reactions to this is that I've thought that as time goes on, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the restrictions on this were lifted. Yes. Uh, when when uh, everybody realizes uh, through this monitored process uh, the risk to benefit ratio of this, I wouldn't be at all surprised if um, ultimately uh, with the family's uh, input the uh, restrictions were lifted. I'll be interested to see what happens. I, I understand that this is just like doing an animal experiment or getting radioactivity, but I don't see why we have to add more layers of complexity to doing science. I think the NIH had no choice. It's a government agency. This is, an, this is a hot issue, and they had to deal with it in this way. And the whole idea of you know, having the sequence out there, even Collins himself says it's of uncertain significance. Uh, his sentence is, the sequence can thus be used to draw inferences ad admittedly of uncertain significance about her descendants. So we don't even know exactly what most of the sequence means at this point. So it's Yeah, and this is a cell line that um, I, at this point, I'll wager it bears only a passing resemblance to anybody in the Lax family right, because right. these these cells have grown for um, hundreds of or thousands of cell generations in laboratories around the world, and and we've already talked about this a bit on TWIV. I mean, Vincent, you had those great <clears throat> those that great line of HeLa's that that laid down nice and flat on the plates, and if Rich takes the HeLa's from his lab and tries to put them on a plate, they just sit there and they don't lie flat. Um, so every lab is going to have a different sequence, and this is a this is a tumor cell line. It is. It's it's no longer native to the, the Lax family. This is a cell line that's native to the laboratory. Um, yeah. Well, well, I, I want to disagree a little bit with that because I think one of the outcomes from from this is that um, the the Gila genome isn't as varied as they might have expected. So they okay. So the the beauty of this work from the UW group, AD et al. Uh, from Jay Shandur's lab. Um, is that they sequenced the CCL2 strain and then they did some comparisons with uh, something that has a 3 in it. Um, S3? Uh, S3. Also, uh, S3, yeah, I guess. That's, that's quite, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of the sequence that's out there is from the S3. And so they make um, some pretty strong comparisons between those and it's, it's not as variable as you might think. And then the other thing that I think is important, and while yes, you could, you could get the cells and you could sequence them, that would be a huge expenditure of time, money, and resources. And these people have done it, and they've done this haplotype resolution that makes the genome sequencing far more meaningful than just the sets that are already in the database. And so the phasing problem is was well described in, in one of the lay articles, the New York Times article, where if you sequence the genes, it's just like a bunch of it's just like a bunch of beads. And our chromosomes, because we have two copies, one from mom, one from dad, those the way those genes are involved are, are um, 
arranged on the two strings, which comes home from mom or dad, uh, is relevant. And it takes a huge computational effort that these guys did to, to figure that out and figure out how many copies of each portion of the genome is there. And so I think that is a huge value added that you wouldn't just get by you know, putting it together from the database or, or whatever. So Well, but I would just say those are those are all legitimate barriers, technical barriers, in the year twenty thirteen. I don't expect right. those all to be the same barriers ten years from now. True. True. I think but, Rich's point is good that I would be interesting to see how this evolves and how the family views it. And maybe they'll say at some point, you know, take it or whatever, because you know, I'm just troubled at this point. Um, but I, even though I understand why they're doing it, it's a little troubling. Yeah, yeah, but as I say, it'll it'll be easier for in the future for the family to say, okay, you know, that was probably a little too restrictive. We can back off, and the NIH can back off. <clears throat> yeah. Then it would be to say, okay, everybody can use this genome. It's fine with us. And then to discover ten years from now that this is going to jack up their insurance rates. And I think the family is on board with this. I mean, as Kathy pointed out, one of the options was not releasing it at all. And the family, according to these reports, was was against that. Uh, they have uh, they have participated. They understand the value of this stuff, and they uh, uh, have participated in it. I think the the uniqueness of this situation is that I mean, the the whole issue with the uh, privacy HIPAA as we call it now, is about de-identification of samples. And what makes this situation unique is that the samples, uh, uh, we can't do anything about it now, uh, uh, are identified. Okay, And that makes this a unique situation. And it all has this you know, really unfortunate history uh, associated with it. And I think uh, in this particular case, we have a responsibility at least now to uh, 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 respect the family. Uh, and I think make, in the future it's business. actually going to be difficult to de-identify yes. a lot of other things. Yes, exactly. yeah. um, so right now everybody can identify who the Lax family is obviously and they know that the HeLa sequence came from there but um, I, I foresee a time very soon when your genomic data uh, will be uh, kind of de-identified, right. but it turns out that it's actually pretty easy to figure right. out who you are. Right. Um, and, and so, again, I'm I'm in favor of these sorts of these sorts of restrictions. Just for the record, if my genome was ever sequenced, everybody can have it. You can have my whole family. <laughs> I don't want it, Vincent. I, I know you don't want it, but <laughs> I think I would put it out there because, and of course, my mother wasn't wronged in this way, so I I understand, but. I feel that it would be a resource or could be a resource for science. Now so you have you have a um, <laughs> uh, a kid who might object to that, it's right? Too bad. It's really too bad. <laughs> Actually, I could talk him into it at this point. I just <laughs> want to point out the uh, the article in Nature has a really cool picture of the Lax family yes. Yes. around um, a memorial in Virginia that put that was put up. Henry yes. Lax. This is a really cool picture. So hopefully this is open access. I don't know if it is or not. Yeah, yeah, I just uh, yeah. And there is there is some good science that we should get back to another time in this oh, paper okay. that, has, that has to do with virology um, <laughs> because I think it would take a while to really discuss. Okay, it. I was yeah. I was just going to give a couple of short. You short, can go ahead. Uh, go ahead. So because I think the science of it is really cool because they can do this phasing. They could uh, identify. So it was it's known that the. HPV18 is integrated near the MYC gene, and the MYC is known as a uh, cellular uh, oncogene, proto-oncogene. That's the uh, human papillomavirus, 18. Right. HPV18, right. Sorry. And so, um, but because they can do this uh, phasing, they point out that if you don't do that, sequences have the potential to be misinterpreted if the an analysis doesn't include the uh, taking into account the aneuploidy and the phase. And so, in other words, which chromosome something is on uh, relative to the other genes upstream or downstream. And, and so uh, the results that they get is that integration of the virus near the MYC gene is a major part of it. It acts in cis rather than in trans, so it acts on the same uh, chromosome rather than in trans. And that also they have a large amplification of 
an epithelial specific viral enhancer and that can give them uh, a very high copy number uh, within this repeat structure that meaning that then this thing can get replicated a lot or uh, uh, amplified a lot in the epithelium and that could provide pretty strong support for why these cells are so uh, tumorigenic. So, so some cool it, virology. It's not this is interesting because it was not known or considered that HPV was an insertional mutagen. Rather, the, the two viral oncogenes, E6 and E7, uh, their continued expression was what transformed the cells uh, to, to replicate continuously. So, and I, and I looked, uh, there are a couple of papers out there indicating that this is an, an unanswered question. So the fact that the, these two genes integrated next to MYC could have some bearing uh, on the properties of the cells, but we have to also remember that as cells multiply uncontrollably, other mutations also accumulate and those are clearly involved in tumorigenesis and metastasis potential and so forth. So it's not just the insertion site uh, that's right. important there. Right. But yeah, that, that is pretty interesting. It'll be interesting. One paper I did find in PLOS One, which I'll, I'll put a link to, um, they looked at insertion sites in other uh, cervical tumors, uh, that is E6, E7 insertion sites, and there isn't a, a consensus, a particular place, it goes all over the place. So CMYK may be rare. Um, and it's interesting that one of the two proteins, I don't remember which, E6 or E7, actually antagonizes uh, CMYK. So um, this may uh, accentuate that in some way. That's quite interesting. All right, let's... Um, Let's just do um, uh, two emails, okay, and then move on to picks because we're we're long here on this. Yeah. Um, Kathy, can you read um, the first one from Jim? Jim writes, Hi, Vincent. Dr. White has been netcasting since 2008 and seems to share your values about teaching. His site is Surgery 101, and this link goes to it and a YouTube video he did, Surgery and the Singularity, where access to the archives, etc., can also be found. I thought the two of you might benefit from swapping ideas, if this is new info for you. I think he or whoever edits his podcast could do a better job with the sound inserts. Lastly, your students might appreciate two other medical professionals who recently started podcasts. One is a pre-med student who does Lost in Pre-Med, which led me to the Medical School, a medical school HQ done by a flight surgeon. Regards, Jim. And Jim is our friend from Virginia who's written to us quite a bit in the past. Yeah, I thought people would like links to these podcasts. Mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of interesting. Um, I just wanted to point out that our my Coursera Virology course is in its third week. We have two th 28,000 students registered, and it's quite active over there. Cool. Uh, R Rich, can you uh, read the second one? Sure. Uh, CN writes, Greetings. In your recent episode, TWIV 230, a listener queried regarding SARS. I must say that you did a very good job in explaining and summing up the current scenario. I wish to cite you a link to EID podcast that has provided excellent information regarding SAME. And he gives a, a link to Emerging Infectious Diseases podcast on SARS. Time devoted to someone is time given. I understand from your conversations that you spend almost five to six hours a week for Twix and spend additional time on your background reading. I and probably four and a half thousand listeners around the globe appreciate it. Number is approximate based on uh, likes and Facebook. Uh, I find it very brutal that you couldn't be nominated at the science podcast because you produce a higher quality detailed science than anybody else, at least from the podcast I listen to. Yours is the best. If I could suggest a listener pick of the week, that would be Steven Pinker's How the Mind Works. I'm sure any person who has the latest understanding of neurobiology will be able to grasp the literature written here. It is just too good. Thank you. Never give up. Uh, never let the Twix stop. P.S. Please let Kathy speak more. Twix fan and regular listener. I think we let Kathy speak, of, you know, a fair <laughs> amount. I don't think we, uh, you know, if you guys wouldn't just keep going on and on and on, uh, you know, and just so she can't get a word in wait, edgewise, wait, what do you wait. think, Alan? Right? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think that could be an issue. <laughs> uh, yeah. You want, I'm sorry, Kathy. We apologize. We'll let you yeah. talk more. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's stop there and do some picks. Kathy, what do you have for us? Okay. Uh, I have a long list of uh, things to ha in my pick of the week queue, but I picked this one because it's still vacation or summer anyway. It's called GeoGuessr. And you go to this site and they show you a picture of something and then you try and guess where it is. And you can, it's like a, a Google Earth thing kind of. You can uh, scroll around and get other clues from what side of the road the cars are on or what language the signs are in or something like that and try and figure out how close you come to the actual location. So whether you're out on vacation uh, and you want something uh, to do or whether you're staying at home and uh, want to see some other sites, you can go to this uh, GeoGuessr. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> yes, I booted this up while I was supposed to be cramming for TWIV and got completely distracted. <laughs> Um, fortunately, on one of them, I found uh, a little sign that said some, uh, that named the town, and I scored a bunch of points there. Uh, and others, I was surprisingly close, but this is really, a, it, it's fun. This is yeah. good fun. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You could spend a lot of time messing with that. Mm -hmm. Alan, what do you have? I have a YouTube video. Uh, this is a claymation animation of um, infection uh, by... Della Vibrio Bacteria Vorus, um, and it's uh, it's very fun. It's a very very short couple of minute video, but uh, shows these these little uh, vibrios coming in and infecting their host and producing more claymation with with great. appropriate background music. Yeah, I love claymation. This yeah. is great. Yeah, this is a cute one. <clears throat> Load it up now because it'll play. It'll play. Right. Uh, I've got mine. Uh, I've got mine muted so that I can watch it. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Very good. Oh, a little smiley face. That's good. Yes, a little smiley like face that. at the end. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I another. have uh, another YouTube video that my brother sent me, and it is a uh, 1981 primitive internet report on KRON TV, and I guess that's uh, San Francisco. So this was a report that was put out in 1981 reporting on some uh, newspaper people who uh, had the novel idea of trying to publish the newspaper on the on a computer network and it, it's just it's a riot well it is a hoot. Uh, yeah. it's amazing how far we've come yeah. uh, so it has a guy uh, in uh, in his home using the old I don't, what are these called where you put the telephone handset into a oh modem, the audio basic. modem linkage yeah, yeah. right yeah. so he's getting his thing at like 300 baud or something like that uh, and it would take him decades to download the whole newspaper and all the screens are these old CRT screens with green writing and it's all command line stuff uh, no pictures or anything and they're talking about how this is an experiment uh, oh they say we don't think we're going to lose any money on this. Ha ha! Ah. Big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, one of the things I like best is the guy with the uh, computer using this. It's got uh, as a sort of a tag on the screen. It's got his name, and then it says "owns home computer." Like that's a big <laughs> deal, right? So it's entertaining. It's Bill uh, Gates's goal to have home a computer in every home. You know, when I when I was sequencing polio at MIT, this was 19 uh, 1970. When did I go there? 79 ish. I had to upload the data, the sequence data, through an acoustic coupling modem like that. I used to dial up the mainframe and I typed in the sequence by hand. That's wow. how far we scored. It took me a year to do it. Uh, my pick is another video of Dave Bella uh, back at ASV. The two of there, I picked his uh, his interview that I did with him about cryo-electron microscopy. And this is a video uh, done in at the same meeting in, in Manchester at the SGM meeting. And this is his Peter Wilde Award talk. And that's an award given uh, every year for microbiology education. And he does some really cool stuff, not only uh, in his lab with structure determinations and animations, but he goes to the local museum and does some cool things with students there. So he talks about all that in his uh, award lecture. 
Uh, we have a listener pick, which we heard from CN, and that is the book. And that will do it for TWIV 246, the first uh, live TWIV out of the studio, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, I like being able to see you guys while we do this. It's yeah, different, this is kind of right? cool. Nice. Mm -hmm. they, so despite having to sign up for Google Plus again, it's it's almost <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Well, we could try it now and then. Uh, you know, I didn't broadcast it, and I think um, if we did, we'd have more people. We could have yeah. a chat room where they could ask questions. At the moment, the highest we had was 11 viewers. We have seven now, so thanks for sticking around, you yeah. seven viewers. Uh, anyway, this episode of TWIV will be at iTunes and TWIV.TV as usual. And if you like us, go over to iTunes and either rate the show or leave a comment, and that helps to keep us very visible there so people can learn about virology and things like gain-of-function experiments, exactly what they are. We'd love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was fun. I liked reading these papers. It's good. I had your colleague Michelle on TWIM a couple weeks ago. It was fun. Yes. She Good. borrowed your headset, right? Yes. <laughs> I'm glad she gave it back to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Well, thank you. It's uh, very enjoyable. I always, I always enjoy this. Nice way to spend part of a Friday. It is. And Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. It's good to have the TWIV crew back again. Yeah, it's good to yeah. be together. I really enjoy this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Right. So when are we going to get Dixon back too? Because I've got I'm saving a pick for him. <laughs> I think he's back either next week or after. He's in um, uh, Australia at the moment, I believe. Wow. God, he really gets around. He does. He does travel. Um, titles. I do like Pandora pandemics and. Yeah, so do I. I think that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. I think. But the other one, we're going to need a bigger lab. <laughs> ah, that's cool. That only refers to one of the stories. Yeah. Well, it could refer to the, the large HeLa sequence, or if you it wanted could to do that refer sequence. To the, it could even refer to the, all the new gain-of-function experiments that you're right. going to do. Right. And I like that picture. That's good. It is. Is that from Wikipedia, Rich? No, I, I did an image search uh, on Google. All right. and there's I'll all, find one. There's a whole bunch. I'll find one with find um, find one with open rights on open it. Open rights, that's right. All right, everybody, thanks for doing this early for me. I appreciate yeah. it. Sure, oh, sure. that's great good fun. Great yeah. fun. Uh, we'll see you all next week. See ya. Yeah. All right. Have Bye. a good weekend. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.